Back to My Garden, Episode 9. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here is Dave Ledoux. Attention garden lovers. Do you want to save time, save money, and have your most amazing garden ever? Receive free tips, strategies, and gardening techniques from expert gardeners from around the world. Join the VIP club for free today at www.backtomygarden.com front slash VIP. This episode of Back to My Garden brought to you by Coffee Royalty. Is it really possible to lose 5, 10, even 20 pounds or more just by changing your coffee or tea? Find out more today at www.coffeeroyalty.com. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. When you listen to this, I'm Dave Ledoux. Welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. The aquaponic episode, totally unique. We're going into brand new territory today, and I'm so excited to have literally one of the leading edges, leading minds, thought leaders in the aquaponics movement. He's a third generation farmer. He has a passion for researching and testing the absolute cutting edge of innovation. He's the driving force behind endless food systems. His company has been seen on National Geographic, on Fox Business. He has literally just returned from leading mission trips to Central America to teach communities about aquaponics. His big message today, if enough people learn about this technique, it will end world hunger. I'd like to welcome to the show from Phoenix, Arizona, Mr. Chad Huspeth. Chad, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Dave, for having me on the show. I know it's bright and early over there, and you might even have a bit of jet lag. Can you just take a minute and share with our listeners a little bit about yourself? Uh, Well, yes, sir. I I grew up on a dairy farm, and so uh, honestly, I guess gardening was just part of life. You know, uh, we grew a lot of our own foods and lived a long ways from from any stores. So uh, we we really had to, to grow a lot of food. But, you know, growing up, um, I didn't really consider gardening uh, a passion or anything like that. I guess uh, it was after I was out of college and and realized as I kind of looked around uh, at the way things were going in America and and the the quality of the food, you know, that we get in the stores, Mm -hmm. it's just not, uh, it's not what it is if you grow it yourself. And so I I guess I had a a, a re-spark of, interest in, in gardening and growing our own food and came across uh, aquaponics and just completely uh, revolutionized my thinking. I was very, very excited about it. Couldn't wait to jump in. And, and so that's what I've really been focused on for about the past four or five years. Fantastic. Like the same length of time as going to university or college, right? Uh, do what now? It's the same length of time as if you had gone to university oh, or college. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you could say that. Uh, and it is. It's an education. You know, um, you, you try something and it didn't work, and then you, you try something else and that did work. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of trial and error, I guess. Now, help me because I'm definitely a rookie when it comes to aquaponics. The way I tell people, I w- I've been bragging about you all week. I said, I'm interviewing aquaponics, and they said, What's that? I said, Think of it as a fish powered garden. How do you describe aquaponics? Yeah, that's exactly perfect because so many people get aquaponics confused with hydroponics. And although it's similar, it's very different. You know, in, in hydroponics, you're growing uh, vegetables without soil. But the problem with hydroponics is that uh, on, I guess, a, about a weekly basis, you have to, to exchange your water and you have to add a lot of things to it to, to feed the plants. I feel like that aquaponics, uh, which is where we use the fish to feed the plants is a lot more sustainable because we're not having to add um, really any chemicals into the system and we don't have to exchange the water. It's, it's truly a natural ecosystem, whereas the fish are providing the waste for the plants. Uh, there's actually bacteria in the system that grow and convert that fish waste over into a plant food. And so the actual process takes about six weeks. But what we wind up with is a situation where the fish provide uh, the food for the bacteria, the bacteria provide the food for the plants, the plants use that up and purify the water again for the fish. 
So we never have to exchange the water, and it uh, will run perpetually. Now, for those of you who are driving in your cars or jogging, listening to your iPod with your earbuds in, when you get near a computer, I want you to head over to Chad's main web hub, his blog, all the photos. It's at www.endlessfoodsystems.com. And I have to say that's one of the most brilliant website URLs. The name describes it all, endlessfoodsystems.com. And if you're a DIY do-it-yourselfer, I'd refer you to Chad's site where he has a digital handbook on how you can get started on aquaponics. And for those of you who are not DIY types, Chad, can you talk to us? Like, how did you get into this? This isn't just something you woke up one morning and said, I think I'm going to grow a fish-powered garden. <laughs> no, uh, it, it wasn't. And in fact, uh, it was at Christmas time, uh, I don't know, four or five, maybe six years ago now, I was at my, my dad's house in Texas, and he was telling me about uh, a guy he had heard of, a missionary, that had been uh, figured out a way to grow uh, perpetual food for people over in Africa and, and different places. And he happened to have a uh, kind of a home base in Dallas. And we got really excited about it. It's like, what is this thing? I, I'd like to go see it. And so we, we wound up uh, driving down to Dallas. We called this guy and, and went over and we saw his system. And uh, it just totally blew me away. I couldn't believe that uh, you could do all of this in, in such a compact little area and uh we spent the whole afternoon with him and i've i've since developed a, a relationship with him in fact he's one of our main dealers in the dallas area now uh, that that resells our uh, kits uh, our modular kits but he's really spent uh, john musser's his name with aquaponics and earth.org and um, he spent a lot of time and years going to to the mission fields and places like Africa and helping those villages come up with ways of growing their own food. And I wouldn't say that he pioneered, you know, aquaponics. Uh, it's, it's actually been around probably for thousands of years. But he is definitely one of the, the main uh, forefront guys that figured out kind of how to do it in a backyard type of setting to where we control those fish and we control that waste and send it into uh, – you know, grow beds and, and figuring out the right type of, of uh, gravel to use and things like that to make the whole system work. So I would say that uh, he was probably a, a, a big, played a big part in in me getting excited and interested in this. And uh, so I immediately I came back out to Phoenix and started building systems. I built a, a bunch of different type of systems and toyed with them and, and tweaked on them and really didn't have in mind at all to, to, you know, become a manufacturer or to do anything like that. I just wanted to figure it out and, and grow it for my own family. But then, I guess through the process, um, I learned about other people. There's a guy in Australia named Murray Hollum, and he is, has got some fantastic information on his website and has been uh, building systems in Australia for a number of years. And so I learned a whole lot from Murray uh, got a chance to actually meet him. We went down to the Aquaponics Associational meeting. Uh, they have an annual meeting every year. The very first meeting they had was, uh, I guess, uh, three or four years ago now, back in uh, in Florida. And so we went over there and got to meet Murray and some of the other movers and shakers and um, spent some time, you know, learning all about what he was doing. And so I brought that knowledge back and applied some things I had learned and uh, it just kind of developed into, you know, what we have today, um, which is a, a kind of a hybrid system. So we we take our water from the fish tank and we pump it through a gravel uh, filtration bed, and that's where the bacteria are converting that fish waste over into plant food. And then we take it a step further, and we actually uh, take that water that's been filtered and we send it through a raft bed, and this is just a uh, raft, styrofoam raft that floats on on top of the water, and we send that nutrient-rich water through that raft bed, and then we return it back to a low point where the pump, uh, water pump's at, and we start the process over again. So that's kind of what our how our system operates and, and gets going. We take so much for granted in North America. You know, food just comes from that magic place where we drive to park, and it has everything frozen and fresh, and we cash out and pay our money. 
but you've just come back from Ecuador. Can you share with our listeners what's been the reaction or the reception to aquaponics in Central America? Well, you know, it, it has different applications for different parts of the world. And, you know, I would say that in America or in wealthier countries, uh, really the cost of food is not that big of an issue. You know, for most people, the percentage of their income that they they spend on food is, is not very much, uh, less than 10% probably. But in countries like Ecuador uh, or even poorer countries like uh, Uganda, you know, a large portion of their their income goes just to food, just to survive. And so this type of technology, you know, being able to go in and and uh, really what I was about on this, this trip, uh, we were focused on teaching the people there how to build these things. In fact, I got them all together as a group of about 20 different pastors uh, from different churches, and, and uh, it was mostly people, local people from there, um, there was only a small group of us that, that flew down there. But the whole point and what I gathered them together was to teach them how to reproduce these things. You know, I, I told them if, if I'm the only guy going down here and, and building these things, then it's not going to spread very fast or very far. You know, we need to all work together. We need to um, build our knowledge together. We need to share it with everybody we can. And that way, you know, in a couple of years, Maybe there'll be hundreds of systems across Ecuador, and we can feed lots and lots and lots of people. Wow. See, this is fantastic, because you started off, I'm going to be an aquaponics gardener. Then your entrepreneurial streak kicked in, and now you have communities, and you're connecting with the movers and the shakers, and now you have visions for countries. (laughs) You're a unique individual, aren't you? It's fun. I mean, you know, and it... I don't. I guess I don't. I never sat down and, and decided that this is what I was going to do. It just kind of happened, um, and doors continue to open. You know, uh, one of the guys that that came up in Ecuador. We were in uh, Quito, or just actually outside of Quito, Ecuador, and we had a pastor drive up from Peru, which is a pretty long distance. And he brought his whole family up just to learn about aquaponics. He was so excited about it. And after we built, a, it's a pretty good sized system. We built this system, and he. Uh, we got together at the end last day, and he came to me. He's like, you know, I'm going. I'm going back to Peru, and he said, I, I really want to, you know, uh, involve as many high officials as possible. And in fact, if if I could get the ear of the president, I would love to to do that. And uh, so, actually, we're. I think we're going to plan another trip, probably in February, to go to Peru and help this guy. Uh, refine what he's got or, you know, grow it a little bit bigger. So it'd be fantastic if Peru could uh, come in there, too, and and have systems spread all over the country. You know, Chad, a lot of our listeners, they know people that would love to get into this, but fear, doubt, and trepidation make them hesitate. Can you share a story maybe from five years ago when you got started? Uh, I call it the catastrophic failure. Do you have anything humorous where (laughs) things didn't go quite perfect? Oh yeah, <laughs> I had a uh, I had a raft bed, and I was still experimenting. Oh, I still I still am today, but uh, back then I had uh, a cantaloupe, a couple of cantaloupe plants, and they were doing so good. They were just lush and green, and, and they were covering the entire bed. And I had these little small cantaloupes that were probably about five inches in diameter. They were they were getting close. You know, they were just a few weeks away from being able to to eat, and I noticed, I went out one morning, and I noticed there was a few little aphids on one of the leaves. And uh, I was in a hurry that day. I don't know what was going on, but I didn't stop and and take care of it. And about three days later, when I finally uh, decided to do something about it, I realized as I start picking up the leaves and looking on on the underside that it's just covered up with aphids. And so within, I, I, you know, I put on some organic uh, controls and did about all everything I knew to do at the time, and it was too late. And it was so heartbreaking, you know, to have, I don't know, I probably had 12 or 15 of these cantaloupe that were just so close, <laughs> and they all died before I could, before they went to maturity, and it was, it was very sad. Yeah, the, being a rookie gardener, I'm in my third season. I still fight the emotional attachment to my crop. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was. I tell you what, when you see those bugs, you've got to react. You have to do something right away. And they'll get you. Can you talk to me a little bit about the eating side of the equation? Um, in my head, I picture all the fish, the garden. Um, what are we talking about when it comes to actually putting food on the table from uh, one of these typical setups? So maybe talk a little bit about sizes as well. Okay. Well, there's, um, you know, with aquaponics, we have uh, a lot of differences with that versus uh, soil gardening. And, you know, why would somebody, why would you want to do aquaponics over a soil garden? Well, there's times when it's uh, very advantageous, and then there's other times where maybe it's not advantageous at all. You know, if a person has rich soil, uh, water is not an issue, and they have lots of land, then a soil garden is great, you know, but... For a situation where uh, maybe the soil is not good, uh, you know, in Peru, north, northern Peru, it's, uh, it's just this sand. It's uh, like a very fine uh, sand, and it, it, it just hardly any nutrition in it. It's hard to grow in it. Uh, other places, even like uh, in the inner cities and stuff, it's all concrete. There's, there is no soil. And so there's advantages uh, to aquaponics in the fact that it doesn't use soil at all, we use actually uh, gravel as our as our medium. And then water is a big deal. You know, there again, if a person lives in a place where they get lots of rain and water is not an issue, then it, it may not be an advantage. But for places like uh, where we were at in Ecuador, those people there, they draw water out of a, a, about a 35-foot deep well with a bucket. And so water is very labor intensive. You know, to get enough water to, to grow a crop would be a, a lot of work, a whole lot of work. And so what we did is uh, to, fill, to, do, to do the initial fill of the system, uh, this was a pretty large system that was built down there. It was uh, 1,200, we had two 600 gallon fish tanks, so the total water in the whole system was about 3,000 gallons. And so we, uh, we actually paid for a water truck to come and fill it up initially. And then to keep it topped off, uh, it's going to take about five to eight five-gallon buckets a day. Well, that's a lot more doable than trying to irrigate an entire garden. Uh, Because in aquaponics, we have a lot less uh, water loss. We we continue to recirculate the water in the system. So the only water we lose is to evaporation. Um, With that, we can calculate that an aquaponic system uses about 90 to 95% less water than a traditional garden because you're, you know, in a, in a soil garden, your water goes right past the roots and back down to the water table via gravity. So in a closed-loop system like an aquaponics, we're, we're very water uh, conservative, and we don't really care about the soil conditions because we're not growing in the soil. As far as food production goes, um, if your system's well-managed and, and – um, your pH is decent, and there's a lot of factors involved. It's really not that hard, though. Uh, but if your system is running where it should be, uh, you can generally plan for at least five times, if not, you know, I've seen as high as, as probably ten times the production per square foot of what uh, a dirt garden will do. And I think part of the reason for that is because the plants are continuously watered. You know, they drink when they want to. It's always there. The water's carrying the nutrition, and so they're constantly being nourished, and the plants just grow a lot faster in this type of setup. And anybody that's done hydroponic growing can attest to, you know, that uh, plants generally grow a lot faster than in the soil. So you get a lot more production per square foot. Um, it's water, you know, conservative. It doesn't care about soil conditions. Um, I guess the negative factors would be, uh, that it does use a small amount of electricity, we have to run a water pump. And uh, in some situations, we also need an air pump. So, uh, But it is a small amount of power, and it can be ran off of uh, solar panels if a person wanted to do it that way. Um, but as far as food production goes, it's it's pretty good. You know, um, a area, say, 12 feet by 20 feet um, is uh, enough space to provide enough vegetables uh, for usually a family of about three and that may not be you know it, it'd be tough to say that that space would would you know provide all the food of a uh, of two to three people but it would certainly take the place of, of most all of the vegetables uh, oh and on that topic 
you know, a lot of people look at aquaponics and they look at the fish and they're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a lot of fish. Well, actually the fish are the engine that just are producing the, the uh, waste matter for the plants. And so what we actually wind up with is, is about 10 to 12 times the vegetable production that we get versus the fish production. So for example, for every one pound of fish that I grow, I'm going to get 10 to 12 pounds of vegetables. One pound of fish is 10 pounds of vegetables. Mm -hmm. So that's, well, 16 ounces now. There'll be some cleaning too, but that's enough protein for the average human for a day. Right. Um, And in our systems, you know, a 300-gallon tank is kind of the average size tank that that a lot of people go with. And in a 300-gallon tank, uh, you can grow out between 40 to 70 fish per year that will grow from, you know, maybe up to one one pound. So you're going to – a 300-gallon tank is going to produce, you know, 40 to to 70, 75 pounds of actual fish. Now – uh, that's not meat on your table. That's the whole fish. Right. So if you take a one pound fish, you know, you're going to get maybe uh, uh, a third pound of, of fillets off of that. Okay. What struck me when you were speaking, it's extraordinary the water savings. And there's like a water crisis in big pieces of America, isn't there? There is. There absolutely is. Yeah. Wow. Uh, in fact, we. We've gotten a lot of uh, inquiries lately from people in California because I think they've uh, they've really cracked down and they're they've got restrictions on a lot of people in places in California. And so we've gotten a lot of phone calls from folks out there that are wanting to start growing this away because it just takes so much less water. So would you say right now um, the conversation is increasing around aquaponics? It's a growth business. Oh, it's unbelievable! It absolutely is. You know, here in the Phoenix area, I would say uh, it's hard to put your thumb on something like this, but um, I would say in the last two years that we've probably, oh gosh, I'd say we we get probably ten times the you know the uh, number of phone calls and things that that we did you know two years ago. So it's definitely booming with interest. You're super busy. You're an entrepreneur. You're now traveling and doing missions in Central America. Time is super valuable for you. Can you describe for our listeners what your own personal garden looks like this season? Um, well, let's see. It's getting up into the middle. Or I know this may air a little later, but right now it's uh, it's coming into August. And so we are coming into that real hot time of the year. Right now, things look really good. Uh, my cucumbers are, are just massive and growing like crazy. I've got um, – uh, now, I've always got basil. Basil's always – I've always got four or five kinds of it, so i always got that around. Chives, same way. Um, I left some onions in there. I just pulled all my onions out about uh, two or three weeks ago. I had tons of those, and I kind of left them in there too long, but um, I wasn't ready to eat them yet, <laughs> so we – we got those out right now. Um, let's see. It's mostly beans. I've got a lot of uh, uh, different kinds of beans growing in there: uh, squash, watermelon, cucumbers, uh, uh, cantaloupe. Of course, I like melons, and, and this is the season. You know, when it's hot, uh, it's the time to grow all kinds of uh, Israel melon and, and different things like that. Uh, butternut squash. I really like that one. That's uh, the one that I hadn't really tried until uh, probably last year, I, I grew some butternut squash, and it turned out really, really good. And it, uh, the right kind, uh, the kind we grew, you, you bake it in the oven just like a um, sweet potato, and it tastes just like a sweet potato. It's really good. Excellent. Good, good. Now, when you say really hot, we have a global audience. What's really hot like? Oh. Um, 113 uh, for 100 and, 110 to 117 will be our daytime highs. Right for metric system, that's 38 to 40 Celsius. That's that's rough on the plants, isn't it? It is, and and you can't grow in Phoenix without some shade. So I I put on a 70 percent shade cloth. Uh, come about the end of uh, March, mid April. 
Uh, I'll put on a 70% shade cloth, and I'll leave that on until about October. And we get so much sun here, it's, it's very rarely a cloudy day. And so um, we get plenty of sun, but it, it prevents the sun from just scorching the plants. And we'll get good growth normally up until August. And then the month of August, uh, things will slow down and, and stop growing. And then generally September, when the, the nighttime temperatures begin to dip back in the 90s again, uh, then we'll get good growth again. Is there anything that you aren't growing now that you've considered or toyed with experimenting with next year? Um, well, anybody that researches aquaponics is going to find out that uh, potatoes don't grow very well. And I, I tried them again this last year, and they always come out the same way. I don't, I don't know for sure why, because I have, I have success with other root crops, but um, what I'm doing now, we, we've kind of developed a, a wicking bed that ties into our system. So if a person wants to grow potatoes, any type of potatoes, uh, they can grow them in their wicking bed, and it basically just feeds off the system. So the nutrient-rich water is flowing to the wicking bed, but it can't; it doesn't flow back. It's a, it's a, got a check valve on it, so it's a one-way setup. For those of you who are listening. You have to go to Chad's website, EndlessFoodSystems.com. It's all laid out there graphically, visually explained. Uh, if you're a DIY guy, that's the perfect starting point for you. Kits are, are orderable. I mean, it, it is. he's literally created a one-stop resource. That's where you start if you want to get into aquaponics. Um, I want to ask you some questions here, Chad. We call it five quick questions. This is where you get to drop wisdom for maybe the more novice gardener, somebody just dipping their toe into aquaponics. Uh, Are you ready to play? Sure. All right. Question number one. What do you think stops most interested people from starting aquaponics? Oh, I think it's definitely uh, a fear of the unknown, just not knowing, you know, it it looks complicated. And so a lot of people, uh, I think, step back from it because they feel like it might be too complex for them to do. And uh, honestly, um, you can. You can overcomplicate it if you want to. But honestly, it's really not hard. You feed your fish and you watch your pH level, and that's pretty much the, the bare bones of it right there. This is not one of the quick questions. This is a bonus. What's your favorite fish to grow in your own personal setup? Oh, definitely. Uh, Hands down, it's tilapia. Tilapia are a very fast-growing fish. Uh, They're going to go from a fingerling to a pound in 9 to to 12 months, so they're a fast grower, and they're very, very tough. Uh, They don't hardly get any kind of diseases or any problems. I know what tilapia costs when I go to the restaurant. That's one of my favorite eating fish. Imagine having 40, 50, 60 tilapia in your backyard. I can see the appeal instantly why people get addicted to aquaponics. It is. It is a little bit addictive because, you know, there's you go out after a long day at work and you go into your greenhouse or wherever you've got your system set up and it's just that, you know, the water's flowing and kind of like a fountain going and, and it's all green and lush and you're finding new you know, new stuff in there. Oh, wow, I didn't, didn't realize that cucumber was already ready to pick, you know. Uh, so it's fun. It's exciting. Question number two. You've been around fish-powered gardens now going on five, six years, and you've met most of the movers and shakers and become one. What is the single best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, for aquaponics, um, I would think that really it's iron. You've got to have iron in the system. If uh, that's that's one of the very few things that you do have to add to the system because over time uh, it will become deficient in iron. And it's easy to tell because the plants will turn uh, a pale yellow, and so you know you know uh, visually when there's usually when there's an issue with iron. And so you've got to add iron to the system, uh, and that's definitely. You know, probably one of the best pieces of advice that I, I came across. Brilliant. Uh, question number three. We have eager listeners. They say, I'm going to do my research on aquaponics. If you had just two websites to share other than endlessfoodsystems.com, what would they be? 
Uh, definitely would be Murray Hollum. I think it's uh, practicalaquaponics.au is his website. He's out, out of Australia, and he's got uh, a blog as well. Tons and tons of great information. And then another one that is just fabulous is called Aquaponics Nation. And uh, I, I believe that's uh, a blog, and they've got tons and tons of great information on Aquaponics Nation. Fantastic. I love how giving you are. I mean, you're an entrepreneur, you're in business, and boom, it's such a support. You have your own association now just for aquaponics farmers? Uh, an associate, well, I mean, you know, we have our customer, uh, anybody that's that's bought any of our products, they get access to like a, a member's area. We're working on that, on kind of, kind of creating that into a community. So I'd, I'd love to see that, you know, grow and and get a little bigger. Nice. Uh, question number four. I'm just getting into aquaponics. It's my beginning. What's the single most important book that I need to read? Um, i tell you what. There's a lady named Sylvia Bernstein, and she has a book called The uh, let's see, Aquaponic Gardening. And that is a, a fantastic book. Uh, it covers all of the basics of the different types of systems that you can build. Um, it was written about three or four years ago, but it's a, a fantastic foundational book for people to get started. Brilliant. Um, and finally, number five, uh, Chad, what's the number one thing that you think every gardener should try to grow next year in their garden? Uh, well, it's probably just because I like them so much. <laughs> The uh, Super Sweet 100 tomatoes are fabulous. Uh, if, if you've not had a Super Sweet 100, uh, you need to find some of those. Those are the sweetest little cherry tomatoes ever. And if I've got some of those ripe and ready and, and people come to my greenhouse, uh, hands down, I'll, I'll hand them one of those. And a lot of times people will say, well, I don't like tomatoes. I say, well, you need to eat one of these. <laughs> You'll change your mind. And they do. They are so good and so sweet. They're indeterminates, right? They grow pretty tall? Yeah, they do, um, and they'll last a long time. You know, they'll last uh, uh, probably a year or better. Um, now, that's one of the things in aquaponics. You can't let your plants get too too large and, and uh, long-term because the root system will take over the whole bed. But uh, you can leave them in there for a year or so. Absolutely brilliant. Wow. Our half hour has just flown by, Chad. Uh, I want everyone listening please go to Chad's site at www.endlessfoodsystems.com. Please share his contributions on social media. His Twitter is at E-N-D-L-E-S-S-F-O-O-D-S-Y-S-T, Endless Food Syst. Uh, he's got an incredible resource site there. Start there. Encourage and share the message of aquaponics with your friends and other gardeners because, as you have heard, it is a movement and the big message and the takeaway is if enough people learn how to do this technique, it'll end world hunger. Uh, Chad, you've been so generous with your time. I'd like to give you the last word today. Do you have a note of encouragement or a pearl of wisdom that you can share with our listeners? You know, I would just say uh, for anybody out there that's that's considered this, or maybe it's brand new to you, I would encourage you to go and and find out all that you can and, and do it. You know, it's really not that hard. It's uh, You can build a system with a couple of tubs. and You know, you can build a little bitty one or a, a huge one. It doesn't matter. The, the mechanics are the same uh, regardless of the size. I would just encourage people to just do it and, uh, you know, study up on it, uh, look around before you bust off and spend a whole lot of money on a system. Maybe try a small one first and prove to yourself that you can do it. But that's the cool part about it is it is doable, it does work, and uh, it's an awesome way to grow food. I want to say on behalf of all of our listeners, Chad, thanks for being on the call today. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me.